products. Um, but the good news is that at Segment, we've found um, and spotted a lot of patterns um, that when it comes to mapping these objectives, to different software solutions. So I'll get into a lot of that. And they kind of follow this like similar trajectory as your company matures. Um, and it's kind of led us to develop this methodology for how to go about building a tech stack. And like, don't worry about the details of the slide. I know it's a lot, but we're going to like walk through this journey um, in the next like 20 minutes or so. Um, so um, I like to start um, when at, with our journey actually at Segment, and this is before my time, but when we first started, it was just using uh, four tools. We use Google and Mixpanel for analytics. We used Olark for live chat and we used Customer.io for uh, email. Uh, and that's it. And now if you look at, at fast forward like nine-ish years, um, today we use hundreds of tools and has and we have dozens of teams using them across like every part of the customer lifecycle. Uh, and we've seen uh, thousands of our customers go through um, the same kind of like growth uh, growth stack um, curve trajectory. Uh, and I'm just going to be sharing like uh, what our customers have gone through and what we're seeing in the data now. Um, so like let's get into some actual recommendations. Um, so the uh, the first thing that I recommend, this is almost like the only thing that I recommend that every company like must do and what tool every company must have. And that is um, analytics. So why do we need analytics? This may seem like a somewhat rhetorical, rhetorical question, hopefully. Um, hopefully you all, you all see the value in analytics already, but um, we just need analytics because in order to grow or improve our product, we must we need to know what our users are doing and, and map that out. Um, and you can't like fix or or even like see what you can't measure or make accessible to to other teams. And analytics helps with all that. It, it provides the ability to understand your business in a numerical way. Um, it also helps with like knowing if users are getting value from your product or not. And then finally, which we'll get into a lot here, is just modeling and tracking your customer journey and your funnel. Um, so let's talk about funnels, um, which you need mm -hmm. analytics for in order to like build and track your actual funnel. Um, so for the most part, we found that uh, a, a funnel um, typically looks something like this, like a funnel. Um, maybe the pillars here are um, a bit different for your particular use case of your company. But um, the point is that you want to map out your funnel and have analytics power this funnel. Um, so analytics will help you, uh, ask you uh, help you get answers to questions from the top of the funnel to the end of the funnel and help you answer things like, you know, how much traffic am, am I getting and where is that traffic coming from? How is that traffic converting? Um, and of those converting users, um, how are they engaging week over week? And then also, like really importantly, like, how much revenue are we making this week versus last week? Um, so analytics help you track all this stuff. Um, and uh, to make decisions, we're going to actually need to um, collect uh, some customer data and user data to, to get these different like milestones tracked within our funnel, which kind of like brings me to the next topic, which is around data collection. Um, and at this point, you know, when it comes to data collection, you might be thinking, okay, like I've got this, I'm going to add um, Google Analytics JavaScript snippet to my site um, or app, and then voila, my, my job is done. But, um, you know, these types of like uh, JavaScript type page views, page view to kind of like analytics tools don't provide all that much insight into what your users are actually doing and who they actually are. Um, so for that, we need some sort of like more event, uh, advanced event tracking or advanced analytics in place. Um, and which, yes, does take a bit of development work, but when it comes to understanding your customers, it just makes a huge amount of difference. And we have these uh, a sample of these two different types of data collection concepts here on the screen, which you need for analytics and to do analytics the right way, in, at least in my opinion. Uh, the first is an event call, which tells us you know, what event or what action the user has performed. It could be things like a page view, a sign up, a trial, a page, uh, a payment. These are like things that are tracking beyond your tracking or you want to know beyond just like a page view from here to here. And then the second on the right here, we have an identify call, which tells us who, this is really important, tells us who is taking that action. Um, and, it, and it usually is serviced by something like a unique identifier, a unique ID, but it also has this other context about the user that you can accumulate over time. And these are things like their email, their IP address or IP addresses, uh, maybe their name, their phone number, things like that, that is enriching uh, you know, who, who is taking these actions on your web properties or your product. Cool, so with that kind of event tracking in place, uh, we can get this accurate, more accurate representation of how our funnel's actually working. Uh, in this example, um, you can see that a user, user one, two, three, has made it through each of the milestones 
in this um, hypothetical funnel, they signed up for a trial, they played a video, and then they upgraded their subscription to a paid plan. So this is kind of like a nice like little sample of like exactly what you'd want your user journey to be like if you have a very simple user journey. Um, and now we just need to get this event data to go somewhere. And that's an analytics tool. So we can actually analyze it. And this kind of gets into like the actual um, first glimpse of like how to start building out our stack. Um, so once we're tracking this data the right way to truly understand our user behavior, we want to see how our funnel is performing. And for that, we need some sort of analytics tool. Um, so we can implement and send data to something like Google Analytics, which is, which is great for you know, ad hoc questions and some data exploration, but maybe not the best for like dashboarding or like your source of truth kind of data. Um, and then there's more advanced analytics tools like uh, Amplitude and Mixpanel here, which are very good for funnel conversion and doing sorts of like uh, cohort analysis type of reporting, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, and then alternatively, maybe if you have a like broader um, like data science team or data analytics team, sometimes those teams want all of this event data and customer data to get into a data warehouse, which is kind of shown in this middle column here. And then they'll use a BI layer, business intelligence layer to visualize that data on top of your data warehouse. And these are tools like Looker, or Mode, and Tableau, which are all really great at visualizing that. So you can kind of get to um, your analytics from any one of these different types of um, uh, vehicles. Um, so now we have um, analytics and can, can track our, this is a, a, a screenshot from Mixpanel. So this is kind of showing like what our funnel looks like. And, and we can start to like start mapping out, you know, the different parts of our funnel and see where there's gaps. So in this example here, you can see that, you know, someone searched for a song and then they also play that song or video. That conversion rate looks like it's about 50% just eyeballing it, um, which doesn't seem too bad. But then maybe like our metric of truth is to share a song or share that video. And that seems like a pretty big drop off in conversion. So maybe that's where we want to like focus our efforts. Um, and it's even better if we can use a cohort report to see how our funnel metrics are tracking week over week or month over month or whatever time period is right for your customer journey. And these reports give us insight into, you know, where in our funnel has room for improvement first. And then also if we run experiments or improve that metric, how those experiments are impacting our metric week over week or whatever like time period we're looking at. And, and now with these, these types of reports, we can identify um, areas of opportunity and prioritize how to go about building our tech stack and fill these gaps. Um, I'm going to like pause here for a second and just note that, you know, from this point, like building out your tech stack is kind of like a choose your own adventure kind of um, exercise. If your acquisition's low, for example, we might start investing in tools that drive traffic or improve conversion. Or maybe if we're acquiring users just fine, but they're dropping off and not engaging or activating, then maybe we'll want to like invest in some sort of like engagement or activation tools. So, um, so at this point, you know, hopefully you can see why analytics and proper data collection is so important to uh, our prioritization of how we build out our tech stack. Um, okay, so I had to start somewhere. So this may not be the case for you, but I find it helpful to like start by looking at the engagement and activation piece of your funnel first. Um, after analytics, this is usually like the first area I'll inspect because high engagement usually means that you have um, better retention. And if your engagement's weak, it's usually an indicator that your retention might also be hurting. So in other words, you're like filling a leaky bucket. And hopefully for obvious reasons, we understand why we don't want to do that. So um, so let's start with engagement. And if we think back to a few slides um, uh, from our from earlier in the talk to our two key questions, the first question, which is, you know, what business objective um, are we trying to improve at this stage in the funnel? Uh, and the objective around here would be something around improving engagement or improving activation. So this would lead to some sort of like North Star metric that you want to put in place. Maybe that would be for, for this type of area in the funnel, like growing your active user account over a given time period or maybe increasing the volume of content consumption within your product. Uh, these are types of like North Star metrics that you can use to try and like drive towards a common goal. Uh, and now that we have that like objective and like metrics in place, um, we can start thinking about what tools we wanna use to move those metrics in the right direction. Uh, and here are like four software categories that are often tied to improving uh, engagement metrics. Uh, and there are probably more categories I'm missing here, um, but this should at least get you started and thinking in the right direction. Uh, so for our four categories, we have uh, email, live chat, in-product activation, and mobile and push notifications. So let's dive into some uh, use cases for each of these. And we'll start with email. 
Um, so email is pretty much like a must, I think, for all stages of the funnel. Um, and it's easy to start with email because it's just like a tried and true way of connecting and communicating with your users or customers. Um, and email can help with a ton of engagement related objectives um, that I certainly won't be able to cover all of, but maybe a few examples include like pulling users back into your products, um, nudging users to uh, take an action that would benefit them, you know, maybe asking someone to try and untap your new feature and the list kind of goes on and on and on. I really love this example here from Airbnb. Um, and to me, at least, this, this, this fat, like, bolded $0 is a motivating reminder that I could be earning um, and I'm not. And as a result, like, I'm compelled to, like, take an action and actually finish my listing, um, which I think is just a great example of, like, how to engage and pull people back into your product. Um, and then the tools here um, are, uh, I've selected a few. I know there's like hundreds of email and marketing automation tools out there. Um, these are ones that we know are proven and work at Segment, but you know, your, your own use case might be different than um, the, or might use a different tool than something that's shown on the screen here, of course. Cool, so moving on to uh, another, I think super effective way to improve activation um, is for reaching users while they're not, while they're, while they're actually like using an in your product experience. Um, and there's a good amount of tools that can help you do just that. Um, and there's not really like a great category classification for these, but I like to call them like in product activation tools. Um, and the objectives for these tools uh, will be pretty similar to email. Um, just it'll just be within your product. Um, so some some objectives that come to mind are things like notifying a new user of an unused feature or product, or maybe providing some sort of like tutorial like walkthrough within the product. In the example shown here, um, it's from Grammarly, which highlights uh, use cases during onboarding before dropping a new user into the product experience. Um, and then, you know, there's not so many uh, so many vendors in this in this category. I feel like um, here are four that we use um, and that our customers use at Segment. So um, I, I would say like any, exploring any of these is a great option. Uh, and then another product category uh, that comes to mind um, for interacting and engaging with users is live chat. Um, and some objectives for live chat could be, you know, allowing users to chat with a support person when they get stuck or, um, you know, using a live chat, chat bot to answer support questions while keeping users like embedded in your product. Um, this example uh, is of a chat bot that will help a user find what product they're looking for. In this case, it's like a plant type of uh, uh, shop. Um, and then some players that we like to work with uh, that are great live chat options are, are shown here. Uh, we use uh, drift at segment for our website experience. And then we actually use intercom somewhat in the inside the product. So we use a lot of different tools at segment. Uh, okay. And then the last category around engagement and activation, um, uh, part of the funnel that I wanted to focus on is just around, uh, really applies to mobile. Uh, and this would be the category of SMS and push notifications. Um, and objectives of these tools will be, again, similar to that of email. Um, but of course, in setting, instead of sending an email, you'd be sending an SMS or a push notification, which can be super effective. Uh, there's a lot of great mobile providers out there. Um, and a lot of them offer like vastly different features from like a full marketing automation suite like Braze to more of like a dev friendly, like do it yourself API options like, like Twilio. Um, so whew, I know that was a lot to um, unpack on just the engagement side. Um, so just taking a quick breath and like one last note before, you know, moving up the funnel to the acquisition piece is that, you know, you don't need to use every single tool mentioned here. Hopefully that's somewhat obvious. Um, one might just be, one might be effective for like what you're trying to go, what you're trying to get to or what your objective is. Uh, and the same rule kind of applies for like the rest of the recommendations throughout this talk. Okay, so let's move up the funnel a little bit. Um, and say now, you know, you found product market fit and you don't really have an issue with activation or retention. Um, so now you're looking to scale your top of funnel acquisition. Um, so your strategy around growth will likely dictate like which tools you use in your stack. Um, so for instance, like if you're finding, if users are finding you through content, you might want to invest more heavily in something like SEO. Um, or if your product's very transactional, you might have a solid grasp of like who your audience is and you may want to invest in some sort of like ad platform. Um, and there's, again, a ton of tools out there to address this business objective of driving traffic um, or improving acquisition. So let's jump into these different categories um, for each. Um, and I think a, a use case a lot of us are familiar with and often a go-to channel is around advertising platforms. Um, and uh, a, a, an objective for this would be driving traffic or awareness for your product or pulling users back in via retargeting. 
Um, and because pretty much like the entire world is exposed to advertising, it's often the first place people go to when moving up the funnel. But I'll like caveat that with it's a dangerous one because it can be costly and it, it often tends to lose efficacy over time. But all that said, like advertising can work really well if you have a couple of prerequisites. You have a solid grasp of who your target audience is and then you know where that audience engages online. And then finally, you, you also have to have a compelling offer for that audience, which is kind of how I have this like Venn diagram built out up on top here is this audience and offer overlap. Um, so with a clear view on these prerequisites, you can use an advertising platform to accelerate growth. Um, and let's dive into this example shown here, which is from an ad that kind of got me to try this product out, which is Blinkist. As I, I'm an avid reader of audiobooks, and I don't have a ton of time. Um, and I don't know what their targeting parameters were, but I'd say this is a pretty great example of having this audience offer overlap. And then finally, when selecting an advertising tool or platform to use, it's really a choice of, it's not really a choice of like which platform is better than others, but it's more of a question for like, where can I best reach my audience for what I'm offering? Um, so any of the, the advertising tools list shown here would be fine, as long as they give you access to the target audience that you're trying to reach. Um, and, and that you also have efficient unit economics too. Okay, so I know that was a lot on advertising. Let's jump on to some other um, categories. So this is maybe like the anti-paid uh, uh, anti, um, uh, category, which is earned traffic. Um, so most of this comes from either search engine optimization or social sharing or referral program type of stuff. Um, objectives to this channel and tools are similar to paid acquisition. Um, maybe a few like additional things would be like optimizing for long-term evergreen acquisition, or maybe just positioning your brand as authoritative and respected, respected in your product category. Um, and what earned channel to invest in, again, really comes down to the channel that best suits uh, your growth um, or where your target audience is at. So for example, if there's a lot of search intent for your products, um, then it's probably a good thing to invest in SEO. Um, or if users get value from other users using the product and there's clear network effects, then maybe you want to invest in some sort of um, referral um, type of tool. And all the so all the tools here are great depending on what your earned channel um, uh, match would be. Uh, I'm a big fan of Ahrefs, and this is a, a screenshot of their dashboard. So a great tool for SEO, which we use heavily at Signet. Okay, so um, let's move on to objectives around conversion, uh, where you might have a decent amount of traffic, but perhaps that traffic's not converting so well. Um, so you might want to use some sort of like A-B testing or personalization tools. Uh, and this example shown here comes from a company called Peerspace, which is an online marketplace. And they've created this personalized user experience on their homepage that personalizes the following blocks of content. They have uh, the home home screen here are the, the hero section, um, which shows the location of the visitor. They have um, brands from relevant industries of the visitor um, coming to this landing page. And then also they have content blocks that also speak to the different like identity of the user. Um, and they've seen some pretty um, solid uh, improvements from having this type of personalization on their homepage. I think they were able to like double signups in a month or so. so cool use case of top of funnel um, conversion here. Uh, I'm going to skip through this, this last one pretty quickly here, which is just like having landing pages um, that you enable your marketing team or like teams that are not so technical, um, either landing page builder or a customer um, management or content management system, a CMS um, is super important, um, especially if you're doing things at like large scale and you want to enable other teams. So for sake of time, I'm just going to skip over that one. And then for the last section, um, I'm going to talk about retention. And our objective for this pillar is usually around ensuring that our customers renew or maybe even expand in some cases and with some sense of predictability. And we typically see these three categories around retention. So let's dive into each. Um, uh, so I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with CRM tools um, because so much of retention has to do with the relationships that you establish with your customers. You know, I think this makes sense to like start with lead with this section. Um, and there's a lot of objectives that CRMs can help out with, like identifying where customers are at in the billing life cycle to get ahead of renewals, or you know, identifying accounts which might be at a churn risk. Uh, this is examples from HubSpot, which I think does a nice job of visualizing visualizing details and activity of what's going on with this unique customer or account. Um, another part of retention is providing support to customers when they run into issues. Um, so this would be um, filling objectives like resolving tickets on time or um, helping existing customers with implementation issues. Um, help desk and support tools are, are kind of essential for all that. Um, this tool on the screen here I really like is a tool called Vitally, which um, provides really informative insights into you know, product and subscription analytics, 
health scores, risk alerts, um, and all that kind of stuff to get ahead of these like support um, and churn risks. And then the final category here is um, uh, probably pretty obvious around retention, which is payments and payment processors. Um, it's essential because it gives your customers a way to pay you and also gives uh, you insights and in analytics into like payment failures, which is pretty essential when it comes to retention and churn prevention. Um, our go-to suggestion for payment processing is Stripe just because their API is so friendly, they have great documentation and just the whole platform is usable, very usable. Um, but um, maybe one last call out here is that uh, uh, there's other payment processors processors and then there's one unique thing on here which is churn buster which is not actually a payment processor but it's a great way to help automate email notifications and nudges around failed payment um, which is kind of a really cool tool um, for recovering churn Whew, okay so I know I'm kind of going kind of fast here and, and I'm short on time so uh, uh, just have a, a few more slides here to share um, three or four more slides uh, and I feel like this part is like where we start to get like really um, good insights into like cool data and use cases um, so hopefully by now you're like in the right mindset thinking like, you know, what is my customer data telling me? Which parts of the funnel should I focus on? Um, and I want to share like a bit of like data and how we've seen tech stacks evolve over time. Um, so let's dive into some trends and examples. Um, and if I were just going to map out like one example of how a tech stack evolves, it would probably look something like this where, you know, technology category adoption is closely related to what stage of the company from startup to large scale um, and, it kind of like maps from like, okay, at first we're building an MVP and then releasing that MVP um, to a small group of users and then launching. And then we found product market fit and like each of these different like milestones in the company journey kind of map to like pretty closely to what tools and what tool categories you're going to be um, investing in at that time. Um, so I think this slide does a nice job of like illustrating that. Um, but let's get into like some fun stuff uh, or at least what I consider fun stuff. So. Um, we have this blog post um, that our, our CTO wrote um, that looks at some unexpected trends that we've uncovered um, as uh, tech stacks have evolved. And we looked at like four years worth of segment data. Um, and the blog post has 10 examples, but I'm just going to share like a couple here. Um, so the important thing for reading these visualizations is that the x-axis represents time. And then the y-axis is a, a graph, a line for each tool that comes online. So we can visualize as new tools are added over the course of time. Um, in this example here, we call it the Bake Off, um, which you can see uh, the, team is the team is responsible for building out a tech stack, tried a bunch of overlapping tools over the course of like a really short period, like a month or two, identified the right tool to solve their problem, and then kept that tool into perpetuity and then removed the tools that they weren't going to use. Um, so this is kind of like analogous to purchasing a bunch of um, a different shoes online, seeing what shoes fit and which, which style you like, and then sending the rest back as like returns. Um, which is kind of interesting. Um, I think this trend is my favorite. It's closely tied to like the narrative of this talk. We call it the scientist. Uh, in this example, like the company seems to be trying out a lot of new category um, category tools to meet their use case, but they're not sure which one to actually pick. So they decide to keep a lot of like similar similar tools running concurrently to uh, to solve like best in breed use cases instead of relying on just one tool for everything. Uh, and then you can see here by the groupings that the colors um, from this workspace moved from a primarily a, like an analytics use case to picking a set of advertising tools and then um, it further still into like screen recordings and heat maps. So the gist here is that like uh, the tech stack expands to new categories like the color coded pieces here and chunks here um, as, as um, their tech stack, as their company grows and they get more advanced and their business evolves. Okay, um, so it's often the case that like new tool adoption, this is the last example, but it's often the case that new tool adop adoption is like hire driven, meaning like a champion um, for that product changes jobs and then implements the stack that they're familiar with at this new org. Um, in this example, it's very clear that this company is getting serious about a particular use case. Um, they likely hired someone to like come in and manage that use case. Um, so here you can see what happens when this new hire is brought on to take on this new, new initiative. Uh, it's usually around like growth, but it could be something around customer success as well. Um, so you can see all these tools coming online in like a very short period of time. Uh, so uh, another thing to call it here is that this appears to be like a very clear proven playbook that was used that spans like just beyond like advertising tools and goes into tools for like analytics and email. So pretty cool like use case and data here. Okay, whew, that is it for my talk. Um, I'll leave you with a, a, a call to action to like try segment if you're building out your tech stack. Um, we make it really easy to build your tech stack and again, send data to the segment and then you can power all your tools with that data. 
Um, so I will stick around for questions. Um, happy to answer a lot. It seems like there's been a lot of uh, activity in the feed here. So sorry for going over. <laughs> oh, no worries. You're good. Thank well, we got to bring you back for a Q&A session, definitely. At the <laughs> sure, sure. Um, broadcast. But we do have uh, questions. Kevin, just so you know, the questions are actually in that. I know. I have been like got scrolled up to like read them. Um, I don't know if there's any way for me to like curate these or. Uh, so, uh, do you yeah. see the ask a question uh, section over there? So. Um, oh yeah, I see sixteen questions here. Okay, wow. Okay. Yeah. So everybody who asked a question, so I encourage you to uh, stay in this room. Uh, we will be starting another session in a few minutes, but um, make sure Steph, uh, Kevin. Uh, uh, agree to stick around for a little bit and answer your questions. And if you won't be able to do it, then email him. And what is the best way to get in touch with you? Or would it be uh, maybe somebody on your team? Yeah, you can just email me directly. Um, I'm pretty active and responsive on email. So it's just kevin.white at segment.com. Um, or yeah, kevin.white at segment.com works. Uh, I don't know if we can like, when we share like the follow up, I'll, I'll be happy to answer questions too. So. Um, well, thank you so I'm much. Share my email. I don't care. <laughs> Did I add it to the chat or no? Oh, it's okay. Oh, yeah, you can add it to the chat. I don't mind. Perfect. Okay, I'll do that, and we'll transfer everybody to the next session. Thanks so much. Uh